Rhino. <laughs> I'm excited for this man because I know we've been looking forward to this for quite a while. Here we are standing in front of <laughs> the mighty F-14. Um, you know, as you talked about earlier, uh, introducing yourself with us, is it, it's an honor to get to be here to see this airplane in person and be able to talk to you and tell me from your perspective, what, what was it like? Walk, walk us through what that's like. I'd be happy to. This is a, a personal and private passion I'll never lose. Uh, I started flying this airplane in, in, 90, or in uh, 82 and I threw it, flew it through 95 and I got to fly all three variants. So what I'll do is I'll kind of point out how things evolved, uh, some of the features that exist. I'll talk to features that don't exist on this airplane but show you the additional things that we've done that brought the airplane way up into the into the 2000s easily. So one of the things that people notice when they come in other than the size of the airplane is that some of them start at the beginning and, and the beginning here is called the Rosemont probe. This was actually one of the sensors that helped program all the air data computer stuff mm -hmm. that moved the wings, that moved the ramps. So, and it also got everywhere we went first. Did, did this is this in conjunction with the pitot tubes? All these time? feed into what we call the CADC, the Central Air Data Computer, which performs all the very simple calculations and complex in those days, simple today, that position the wings automatically and also drop the ramps we'll be looking at inside the intakes to adapt the airplane for different mock considerations and operating environments. At what point in your career did you figure out what that actually is? Day one. <laughs> Day one? <laughs> yeah, they kind of start the whole thing with let's start at the beginning. So that's where we, we end up. But well, come, like, as we go around this way, you know, tell me what was it like the, the first time you sat in this airplane and flew it for the first right. time? Okay, so one of the big advances in the F-14D were the, was the use of an infrared search and track system, which doesn't look like this. It actually has a glass transparent dome. It's transparent in the infrared and allows us to see targets that might not be available to us by the radar or could have other characteristics. It makes it much better to see it in the IR and we can actually get some pictures almost in the IR. So you said well. on the D's, so the, the A's didn't have? The A's and B's did not have that. And that's the easiest visual descriptor. If you can see the front of the airplane, you see the second, then you know it's an F-14D. D, and the difference in the D as opposed to the A and B, bigger engines, Newer radar, new updated Well, so the way the progression went, we had the A with the TF-30 engines, which were always problematic. We flew the engine more than we flew the airplane because of the limitations on it. And then we got to the F-14A+, they called it then a B, which put in the GE-110 engines, which increased the thrust and the ability to operate the throttles pretty freely when you're fighting, which is very important. You want to control your infrared signature and your energy levels, so you're in and out of burner a lot. So when we got to the D, we, we found oh, the B and the D, we found those thrust levels were very, very acceptable. So your first flight in an F-14, was that, a, was that in an A? That was in an A in July of 1982. Walk us through what that, what that was like for you. Well, first we do slugs and slugs of sims. And you get convinced that every airplane you're going to get into is going to blow up on fire because that's all you do <laughs> is do emergency sims day in and day out. So when I took off, I was very startled by the acceleration. Now we're flying slick, no tanks, no weapons on board, and it's a performance demo with another pilot actually in the back for the first two flights. So the first thing you do is do a departure leaving Miramar. It requires you to bank pretty hard this way and then capture a radial on attack and going back out. And I was somewhere back at the end of the runway. Holding on to the Yeah, side. holding on to the tails. <laughs> so first couple times, I, it took me a while to catch the tempo. And then after that, you get into jet tempo. And it really is something that's different that people understand once they do it, that things are happening like this. And so on that first takeoff in the F-13A, max thrust on that takeoff? Trick question, it's don't know. It's, it's less than 20,000 pounds. So for me flying the first time I flew a Rhino and the first time I clicked into full AB on takeoff, I could not help but just laugh. I was just dying a laugh. Like, <laughs> and I totally forgot, like what you just said, I totally forgot. I'm like, oh my God, I have to fly the airplane. I got to fly the airplane because of this big hunk of metal is not going to fly itself. No. We're the ones that need to do it. You and know? that's one thing about the analog flight controls of an F-14 versus other airplanes I flew, like the F-16 and the F-18. Uh, you're very much in charge of what's going on with the controls. There's a little bit of augmentation that occurs, yaw damping, stab control, but it's not like it's moving around like other digital fly-by-wire yeah. aircraft with automatic or you know electrical flight controls. Yep. So that feels solid, but you got to work for that. 
So I see here we've got uh, the, the AOA probe, right? Right. Okay, and then there's more probes here. Walk, walk us through that. What, so I mean, one of those is a ram air pressure. That'll give you your indicated air temp. And then we have a total temperature gauge as well, which is part of the calculation that tells us what, where we want the engines operating. Yeah. So that feeds into a lot of the hydromechanical systems on the airplane, starting with these things. So it's very uh, analog, very mechanical. Mm -hmm. uh, today, if you look at stealth airplanes, they don't have probes like that sticking out. They use flat surfaces and signal processing to derive the same information for all their flight controls, which are much more complicated than the F-14. So I notice here with the gun, it's on the side of the airplane yes, as opposed is. to like the Rhino and the Charleston, that has it on the nose of the airplane. Great. Walk us through what, what specifics of the gun did you have to learn and train? Is the gun, I mean, is the gun up in here? The, is gun, the, gun, back here? the gun is way back up into here. This is the gun gas purge door. So that gives you an idea the extent of the weapon. This is six barrel. It fires 6,000 rounds a minute. 6,000 so, rounds so a minute. So you can empty a burst. And we, we shoot them in about 500 round bursts. But we can change that as required. It's just a little setting in the cockpit. But when you hear it, it is a burt. There's, there's no tanka 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 sound. The first time you shot the gun, did it scare you? Uh, I was impressed. <laughs> Everyone had warned us, and but there's certain things you just can't. Until you experience them, yep. people can talk about them all they want. I remember first time shooting the gun at night on the ship, which is up there on the, on the center of the airplane on the top. They tell you about all the sparks that fly, but nothing prepared me for what it was actually like the first time I pulled the trigger at night. Just total white out, and it actually scared the crap out of me, and I prepared myself the next time I pulled the trigger, but I was like, okay, I need to be ready for that. Did, did you see any sparks coming out of the airplane? No, I, I never operated at night with a gun, but I did operate against some conic boxes in a target site, and I was dash two following lead in, and we were actually going to try and do some filming to see if we could see his rounds hitting, because when you shoot the gun, as you know, you shoot and you're off. You're jinking, yep. especially if you're going against a ground target, because those rounds come back. Now, I believe that intellectually, but to see it happen where every 10th round was a tracer and there's tracers bouncing up toward my altitude and toward my airplane, I became a very good jinker after that. <laughs> that was well, impressive. Well, let's get, so, I mean, I see here, how, how do we get into the airplane? I notice there's no not, there, there's no ladder here like an F-16, you know, it's sitting down. I don't see any way that we can get in. Walk us through what it was like for you on a cross country or something to be able to get into the airplane, how would you do that? You know, if you took this somewhere and flew into a civilian field or something, walk us through that. Well, so one of the main reasons why the Navy has integrated stair stairwells and ladders is that we don't want a lot of extra gear on the flight deck. So that would require being chained down and handled. So integrating a ladder into the design is pretty much part and parcel of the Navy way of doing bit Navy way of doing business. And when you're on a cross country, it's wonderful because almost everybody knows how to release it and then you can get in and out of the cockpit very easily. Is there something in the cockpit that would tell you if this is locked? Uh, no, how you look outside. You look outside? Okay, you, so. You can see it and we talk about it and we actually reach out and grab it as we go up. So there's a couple of stairs that goes back to the Rio compartment and the pilot's cockpit. So you make sure all that's locked up before you climb in. And obviously your plane captains some place are responsible as well, but no, there is no warning light as far as I know for any of the more recent jets. So uh, where do you check your luggage? I mean, where does your luggage go? There isn't. Uh, <laughs> if, if you're lucky enough to have some kind of a cargo carrier, we don't have those, yep. I don't think, very often. So almost everything goes in to the back of the canopy behind the Rio seat. Do you guys, do you guys call that the hell hole? Uh, no, it's it. the canopy. The little canopy yeah. box back there? Yeah, so we put a bag in there to hold debris down. So there's been some disasters where something has flown from there into the ejection seat and caused some very yeah. bad things to happen. So yeah. we're pretty careful about how we containerize things within the cockpit. Were you ever worried about the structural integrity of this as you guys were getting into the cockpit? I'm not it, little and it never broke. Never broke. Never yeah. broke. Engineering masterpiece. So you would walk, so you would walk, so actually looking up in here, I can see there's all kinds of, man, hide valves and all kinds of different things. It's crazy to think about when you take the skin off of an airplane, what actually makes an airplane go. Well, without question, access to those things are really critically important. And as you're aware, all these fittings have a, a design to where you can remove them somewhat easily. Mm -hmm. And yet when they're secured, they're secured for this airplane to be all in Mach 2.2 2 point something. What's, what's the fastest you've ever been in this airplane? Mach 2. Mach 2. In a very slick airplane. Which indicated what? How, what was the airspeed? I uh, can't really recall. I was too much enjoying how dark the blue was. <laughs>
And we would actually fly a very specific profile that optimized the acceleration and the atmospherics to get up to the fastest Mach possible, the highest altitude possible. That's part of our intercept routine for when bad guys would come out and try and do things to the ship. Yeah. So that was very much something we were good at. So while we're here at the nose, I, I, I want to talk about this as well. Can you walk us through kind of what the launch, the launch sequence was like back in the day for you on the flight deck, how that defers, how that defers from taking off land base. And now walk us through what all this process is so we can, we can kind of relive what it was like, man. So one of the most amazing things to me about engineering and metallurgy is that you can take this launch bar, which essentially is an I-beam right through here. And this is the means by which you yank up to 60,000 pounds of Tomcat down a catapult track to 150 knots in under three seconds. So there's an immense amount of stress and strain on that particular element. So as we approach the catapult, we would kneel the airplane. The, the, the uh, distance here you see in the oleo would compress. Yeah, right here. This here? Uh, this here. This. So okay. the whole thing would compress, and then they would release the launch bar and it would lay on the deck. And then the catapult will come up behind these two ears on the launch bar and securely tug on it and go into tension to make sure it's secure. A young man or woman reaches up and looks at it one more time, gives a big thumbs up to everybody on the flight deck and runs away. And he runs in this direction because those engines sound like that. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> I recall being on the flight deck as an enlisted guy, watching Tomcats go into tension. And I will never forget the experience of watching, as you just said, where they come in up to the catapult, JBD comes down, they get up into the shuttle track. And then as you guys go into tension and you just watch this badass airplane go from this to then even more badass. <laughs> it's like, I remember yeah. asking a chief, I'm like, I want to do that. How do I do that? It just was the most incredible experience to watch all the troubleshooters get everybody set and ready to go to make sure everything is clear. And then I remember, and I'd love to hear your perspective of what it's like too. I remember the first catapult shot I ever took. I just, I felt like I blacked out because I was so excited and the adrenaline was so full. But once again, like we talked about earlier that you still have to fly the airplane. What was that like the first time you went into detention? It is truly one of the places where you surrender control of everything. Because once you've dropped the launch bar, once you've accepted the tension, once you've run it up, swept out the airplane, knowing there's a ton of eyes on you, so you're confident in the fact you're not squirting oil or hydraulics or fire anywhere. And they all give the thumbs up. The shooters are going like this, making sure every one of the gang has got a thumbs up and they reach down and touch the deck. Now, one of the things about the F-14 that's different than the F-18, for example, is that the inertia from your cat shot actually deflected the control surfaces because the stick moved back. Mm -hmm. So some guys would hold on to the stick. I like the catcher's mitt method. I would hang my hand back, have the throttles cocked up in there, and then catch the stick as it came back. So when you see catapult shots of an F-14, you almost always see the stabs dig way deep. Mm -hmm. And we want to do that. And we'll talk about the stabs when we get to the back. They're very big. Yeah. And that gives you the motion in the nose right away to get you up and away. And also the spring release of this thing coming out of tension also jacks the nose up. So you get a very positive feeling of flight. Unless you're really, really heavy and there's not quite enough wind. And you get that sinking sensation off the cat. But you're already configured and you're flying away very easily. I see these lights here. Walk us through what these lights are. These are one of the ways we communicate without comms, just using visual signals to the LSO, the landing signal officers. So there's three lights on there, and what we're trying to show is whether or not we've attained the on-speed condition. The on-speed condition is very important, and it's a yellow donut in the middle, because it tells us the airplane is flying at the proper attitude that allows for the most proper engagement of the landing gear apparatus and the resting gear with the wires. If you come in too flat, especially in the Tomcat, the hook will come up and you'll bolter. Mm -hmm. You come in too steep and you can actually catch an early wire. So it's critical that you be on speed. Now the LSOs can look in an airplane and they can see the relationship between the tail fins and the vertical stabs and the horizontal stabs in the airplane and get a very good picture of what's going on with that aircraft being on speed. But these are backup lights. So if this has failed, will that give proper indication? Depends on the failure. Wow. And, and we always compute the actual airspeed as well. 
So the Rio, especially in the F-14 crew management, is looking and computing the airspeed that equates to an on-speed. So when you're on speed via angle of attack measurements, you pretty well know what your airspeed should be. So if you lose your angle of attack, you declare that so nobody's expecting to get good signals out of that. Mm -hmm. And then you're talking about just flying an airspeed at that point. So let's let's continue, move back in the airplane here. Talk us, talk us through the intake here. I noticed that we've got these louvers here. Looks like it's on like a suspension or something. Walk us through what that is. So one of the things about the F-14 is we wanted to operate over very slow speeds for maneuverability and landing of the ship. And of course, be supersonic to be able to do our primary mission of air intercept at the time. That was our only mission in dogfighting. So you have two sets of things going on here that adapt the aircraft to the speed and altitude. For the engines to operate correctly in the supersonic regime, you've got a series of panels that all deploy at various Mach numbers and under certain conditions. When we're starting up the airplane, we run an onboard control that exercises all those things and you end up with this coming down to here and you can see a very oh, compressed yeah. area so as it comes all the way down there you end up with a very rapid venturi effect build up and makes it extraordinarily hazardous to be around this area but after that runs and it's up in a locked position we know that we have exercised those ramps and we can count on them flying as we approach supersonic feeds or speeds they start adapting to the actual Mach number and also considering the altitude and other issues like the air composition, etc. So it's a very complex system and it had some opportunities to fail. Pretty reliable system. You can see the hydraulics. So once you have hydraulics, there's always an opportunity for a seal or yeah. something to let go. I personally never had any issues with the onboard. System. Is this is this an automatic system or is it yes, something? Yes, once you take off, you employ it, it's automatic. Automatic. You can disable it if you want, but the whole idea behind this ramp system is so you don't get a standing supersonic shock wave right here. You want the shock waves to be oblique because the entry of the air through a shock wave loses less energy. Walk, walk us through that. That's, that's something that I probably haven't heard or a lot of our subscribers haven't heard. What, what did you mean by that shock so, wave out here? So when something? you approach a speed of sound, you'll see it at air shows, people are transonic. And with all the moisture at low altitude, you'll see the, you know, the condensation that occurs mm -hmm. Beautiful visual effects, especially if you yank on the stick and you see all these vapes come off Cotton the back of the airplane. <laughs> yeah. It's a wonderful, visually pleasing thing. <laughs> but what's happening as we go faster and faster and approaching that, we've got a shock wave that builds up. And if an engine was to gobble a shock wave that's not conditioned to do so, you could probably lose the engine. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, what would happen, it would snuff the engine out. So what we like is oblique shock waves, which like I said, instead of having a standing normal shock wave, a whole lot of energy loss in the air going through there, we, we uh, take them into the oblique, and so you get a proportional trigonometric effect of that energy still remaining, but being decelerated. So two issues, decelerate it and keep the energy up though. So that is not a simple operation. Now in the more modern aircraft, they use fixed inlets that have used a whole lot of more con computational power than we had in those mm -hmm. days to figure out what a nominal curvature would be. And then you see in the F-35 series, for example, the vertilist bumps. Yep. So those, that's where that technology went, but this is where it started. Is this, when this employed in the air, did you have any indication that that was working? Is there anything that told you these were no, out? Not that so I recall. it was all automatic from that? It was point. all automatic. And, and if you had a thump bump, you might consider the fact you, if you have a hydraulic issue, you very well could lose control of your ramps based on that hydraulic yeah. system. Yeah, engineering marvel. All yeah. right, let's keep moving back. So one of the things about the F-14 that was really a challenge for everyone is the amount of hydraulics that were in the airplane. Uh, we would frequently joke if you saw an F-14 that was not leaking hydraulics, it just then it was empty. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So you can see how some of them are set up to have some flexibility to them. Uh, all of them will flex under pressure, under temperatures, et cetera, et cetera. So this is frequently a site for a hydraulic leak, that and underneath a lot of the engine components as well. So that was just something we always had to be concerned about. We would check the hydraulic reservoir. That's something that people probably don't think about very often is when you have an airplane that's designed like this, especially with the wings, with the flex, mm -hmm. right? When you get under high G and you start pulling pretty hard. There's a lot of motion. Is that there's a lot of flex that goes on here. There's a lot pipes. of things that are going under the six and a half G's that you're allowed and the other G's you sometimes are not allowed, but you use them anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the airplanes would have a tendency to break much more frequently with an overstress. 
So we had no automatic overstress limiter like you mm -hmm. do on some other craft where you can paddle it off if you need it. It was all in the bicep. Yep. And if you were out of training because you've been at sea and suddenly you were fighting, you could over-G the aircraft extremely easily, yeah. which required a whole lot of maintenance effort afterwards. I bought a lot of pizza for troops so <laughs> trying Me to work too. on it. <laughs> so then the other thing I love about the Navy airplanes is the landing gear. But before we get there, one of the interesting parts of the airplane is where we attach a bunch of our weapons to them. Uh, this particular station, uh, 1A and B, uh, on this particular one, we could put Sidewinder series missiles on. But down here, we could put uh, several different things. On some of the older or younger airplanes, they could put a lantern pod on the station. We can carry all the way up to an AIM-54 Phoenix, which gives us the capability of carrying six of them, four under the belly, and one Phoenix here, and then probably two Sidewinders. Wide variety in the loads we would carry but we always would go with FAMO, full ammo. So we would call if we had two Sidewinders, uh, two Sparrows, and two Phoenix, that would be a two, two, and two FAMO. So that, that's the way we kind of designated those things. If you had that much ordnance on the airplane and an F-14, could you feel the weight when you're flying around? You could feel a decreased level of performance, but it gave you such a great feeling having that ordnance that you kind of overcame that. So while we're here, I'd like to talk about this as well, is okay. the wing sweep. Is that something that's speed driven? Could you control that? Both. I mean, okay. Both. So one of those things I was talking about before with respect to operating over a wider domain of airspeed and altitudes, the variable geometry wing brings a level of complexity that you have to do a lot of understanding of before you got design, go with that kind of design. So for here, it was a very quick understanding that that would give us the ability to tighten up and get aboard a carrier well and still have supersonic performance and low, low speed performance. So the wings in this position are called oversweep. This is for when we're on the flight deck. You'll actually have these go back. Those stabs back there get limited so they don't impact. And then you can oversweep. You can see where the edge of the thing is actually over those bags mm -hmm. and over the stabs. But normally at altitude, if you have full sweep, which is 68 degrees, that is something that would be when you're going the fastest. As you slow down, the wings would creep out. And that is an automatic function. The forward limit of the wings is set by your computers on board. So you can always withdraw and retract the wings further. But unless you did an emergency override, you'd never push them past where the computer says wow. they need to be. So it was, it was, you would sometimes get some wing sweep advisory lights and things. You could toggle those off. It was a very dependable system. And even though we tested it with one wing out and one wing back during flight tests, they had to jury rig a whole got, lot of things to make that work. And we never had one, as far as I understand, in the fleet. We might so, have had some stuck wing sweeps, but not all the way. In, in a given mission, how many times are you sweeping the wings? Unknown. Uh, generally, we'd leave them in auto for the whole mission until we came back going into the break. And then going into the break uh, at the either the ship or at the field, we'd want to tighten up the formation quite a bit. So we'd put them all the way back. We can put them in an intermediate location for bomb if we had some maneuvering to do. Yeah. But if we're just coming into straight overhead and then a break or pitch out, is we'd always have them back at 68 and then we can run them back and then as soon as we hit the break we threw it into auto and the wings programmed out so on top of flying you're also having to managing your wing sweep was it an active during, thought or was it a passive thought just while during flying? the transitions like coming back to land wow everything else was automatic just one more step <laughs> yeah it was it was another thing to do wow. well let's talk about the landing gear so another great characteristic of a navy airplane are the landing gears obviously for the rates of descent you encounter but also the stress of being in the cat shot. So there's, there's a lot of obvious things like these big beefy gear, but the design feature of having a central keel that goes through the entire airplane to keep all these parts in the same zip code after a cat shot or a trap is still an extensive design part and carries a lot of weight loss. So when you look at the contraption down here, so we've got a bend here that occurs. That's why the safety lock is in there. So when we retract the gear- You're talking about this here? That's, yeah, that, that down yeah. lock there comes off before flight. And then that bends like a knee mm -hmm. upwards, and then the rest of the gear comes this up all and forward. up in. Yep. But then coming back down, you can see it's extremely heavyweight gear. But again, we've got all these hydraulic connections going down to the brakes, and it's not unusual for a brake line to fail sometimes. Yeah. Wow. And what would be your, when you're landing aboard the ship, what would your VSI be on touchdown? 660 generally 600 to 660, depending on the angle. And, the wind. and about your overall aircraft weight? Uh, we generally, I believe we had a, a 
weight, a max trap weight of 52K. 52,000. <laughs> so generally we'd get, I believe, about 132 knots was your backup speed in case the AOA failed. And then while, you, so you'd have to land with the wings all the way out. So when the wings came out, you also had the opportunity to drop leading edge flaps that would come out during certain maneuvering conditions. But for landing, they definitely come out. And then we have flaps in the back of the wing, just like a conventional airplane that drops the flaps. And then as it comes all the way out, there's one more flap that hangs right next to the airplane called the aux flap. So we have almost full span of flaps on the, on the wing as well as a leading edge. So all that to increase the camber for a lower landing weight. What's your margin of error on the right side of the airplane coming aboard before you start hitting other airplanes? Depends on what other airplanes are out there. But the <laughs> landing area and the follow lines were well established. So as you know, on carrier operations, one young individual just putting their toe across the file line will prevent an aircraft from landing. Yep. So that those margins of error are very well understood and, and, and followed. Uh, they're absolute concrete rules. And so there's not that many episodes of on-deck collisions during landing unless there's another serious problem, either the aircraft control issue or loss of control. Because if of you landed right of center line, is that something that would Tomcat pilots would even talk about? We, right we, of center line? Quite frankly, I don't recall ever having clearance issues left and right. You'd get the fine talking. If you were off too much, the LSO would get involved yeah. and give you a come left yeah. or right for lineup. Yeah. And usually that last move, the airplane was pretty responsive doing that. You just had to understand you're coming down like a rock if you put yeah. a lot of big control. <laughs> yeah. Bam. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> what, uh, what is this big? Well, this is another this complete mission area for one squadron when we had two squadrons of F-14s on a carrier. Usually the higher number squadron, the 200 series, because the fighters were 100 and 200 series. The 200 series would have a TARPS mission as well as all the other fighter missions. TARP stands for Tactical Air Reconnaissance Pod System. And we had multiple cameras in here. We had a pan camera, we had some still cameras, and we would go on photographic missions. I was never a TARPS trained pilot, but my Rio was a TARPS mentor for everybody. So he taught me how to do it. And we would fly these low altitude, high speed camera runs that were quite fun most of the time. But if there were ships out, you'd go out and rig the ship and you can get very high quality, always black and white. I don't know if we ever did color or not. Yeah. But for military purposes, the black and white uh, are just fine in those days. Now they got. Well, you're effect. flying. Is the Rio running all the picture? Operation yes. In so the all the controls for the lantern or the uh, tarps pod rather are in the back seat. And there's another panel that's actually installed for those aircraft that are configured. And then this goes back up in station. Well, one of the two aft stations where the Phoenix would normally go. In the so back. this was so this would get installed between the two engines underneath. Correct. Yep. How and much it, weight? Could you feel, did this take away from your max track? You, you, yes. Capabilities. Yeah, you, you would less carry fuel. less fuel, but you generally didn't have as many weapons on board either. Yeah. So you'd have some self-protection weapons on a TARPS mission, a couple Sidewinders, a couple Sparrows, and FAMO. Generally, you wouldn't be carrying a Phoenix necessarily with also a TARPS pod. There's no real restriction as far as I remember. But generally, your mission set was a little bit different. So you have self-protect in case somebody jumps you. Yeah. But also, you'd have TARPS escort. If it was really a contested area, you'd have a second F-14 or possibly even two more at altitude mm -hmm. ready to come in and help you out if somebody got upset yeah. with you coming over, taking their <laughs> pictures. Oh, well, let's go to the back of the airplane. This is awesome. One of the important aspects of the design of the F-14 is the size of this horizontal stabilizer. It's uh, comparable to the wing on an A-4, TA-4 or A-4E or Fox or Mike. Uh, but the ability to displace air with this is amazing. And one of the things we're able to do, for example, is on the cat shot I talked about before, you see the stabs dig down, they're flying and they're, they're doing their job. So when you're off the edge of the cat, tail of the aircraft settles, but you're already up positive alpha flying. Uh, when you're fighting the jet, these stabs give you some moves you don't have in other airplanes. Uh, you have to be careful when you use them. If you deploy them with any kind of differential in them, you get a different effect. It might be the desired effect if you're <laughs> anticipating it, but other times it might be a little bit of a shocker. So when, when you get into some of the more advanced flying characteristics of the airplane, there's a coupling between those rudders and the vertical sta stabilization system and the horizontal stab. You notice there's no elevator. Mm -hmm. This is a yeah. flying stave. So between the two, you can get some very interesting effects because as you call, the, the uh, tails have a downward force on them. 
So you have a little bit of a different situation when you cross control the airplane. The airplane can do some pretty amazing maneuvers. It's not like splitting the throttles or anything like that, mm -hmm. but the airplane can still swap ends pretty quickly. And that takes a great deal of finesse. It's not an automatic function of the airplane. So it requires some advanced levels of, of air combat maneuvering. But one of the things I talked about before was after the F-14A got transitioned to the GE-110 engines, they became A pluses and then Bs, they called them. But the F-14D ended up with the F-110 as well. The reliability and the uh, uh, availability of the different thrust positions in this airplane because of the ability to move the throttles was really a great enhancement to dogfighting. So you can control it and you didn't have to worry about the engines popping so and which, stalling. Which one did you prefer flying? Without question, the F-110. <laughs> and everybody understands that the TF-30 was the solution we had to take at the time. It was just the amount of time it took to replace them the way we wanted to mm -hmm. was, a, was a bit unfortunate. You know, it's special for me to get to stand here next to this because I recall as an E-5, you know, on my second deployment, sitting in the back of the exhaust cans right there, sticking our heads out, eating lunch, looking at my other E-5 buddy in the hangar bay, saying like, dude, I can't believe I'm doing this right now. We're <laughs> sitting in the exhaust cans in the hangar bay having <laughs> lunch. It's well, a special moment for me. So every time I get to see these, that's immediately what I go back to is I think about doing that as a young kid in the Navy. It's crazy. Right. These, these engines produce so much thrust that in the F-14Bs and Ds, we wouldn't use afterburner off the cat. Because the problem would be if we lost one of the engines, the asymmetrical thrust was beyond the design point of the rudder authority. So you'll see them all going off in military and then selecting afterburner after they're airborne. Yeah. So it, it's, it was a, and you couldn't do that with the TF-30 because the engine might stall because of the changes in dynamics at the end of the cat shot. So it was, a, it was a great enhancement to the airplane. Wow. But then the bottom line here is a tail hook. So I mentioned before the integrated keel that exists in a Navy airplane that goes all the way from that launch bar we looked at all the way to the recovery point here. Again, the whole airplane is going to be brought to a halt with this puck, this metal construction here. So you can imagine how closely we look at this during pre-flight and make sure there's nothing wrong with this. And we also check to make sure it deploys several times during the startup and, and taxi out procedures. And then this is the fuel dump. And it's unfortunate that sometimes you have to dump fuel mm -hmm. because we have a maximum landing weight. So generally we'd always try and eke out every bit of training we could get with the gas on board so we didn't dump. Yeah. But sometimes you just had no choice. Yep, yeah, you had no, no chance to go fight. You had no chance to do anything else. But then this had to do with uh, some of our radar warning receiver technology that we have located around the different airplanes. And then on the other side of this, we also have our flare and chaff buckets that would be down underneath and we'd be able to deploy them. They're not located on this model. One thing I find is really interesting about the tail hook on the Tomcat is it's, it's one of the, I mean, the length of this is considerably longer than most fighters that come aboard the ship. Do you ever have any issues with twisting bending, snapping of the actual shank of the tail hook itself? No, I don't recall anything ever failing with that, a tail hook. That is We've, an engineering masterpiece. It is, it <laughs> is. And sometimes it's just a bunch of good old American steel with some good old American engineering putting it all together. <laughs> but this particular, I think the only problems we've had is sometimes the sway brace might get loose. Uh, if the snubber pressure was light, you might have a little trouble. Uh, Kick get, back. Yeah, so I was I was taught very early uh, to set the, set the stick on landing so just right at the absolute moment of touchdown adding more back stick to put more downward pressure in the back and getting the hook into the wires mm -hmm. it increased my boarding rate significantly there's no technique for that espoused <laughs> in any document it was just something somebody yelled at me one time so you learn a lot of features that uh, on how to fly the airplane especially this kind of airplane that had a, a, a human interconnect that the later aircraft don't really have because of the digital flight controls. Yep. So this was still back in stick and rudder. It was difficult for a lot of people to handle at the ship. We would screen people coming out of the training command to see if they had the skills at their training command CQs. That would make them contenders to fly this airplane. You needed other things, but you had to be decent at the boat because it was a tough airplane. Talking about skills, any time that you boltered, did you have special words for yourself inside the cockpit or this will be like... publicized now. I'm like, <laughs> no, the, the, the feeling is you were probably, I don't know how many bolters you had, but we could, oh, bolter, a lot. <laughs> we could, we could bolter very easily by relaxing pressure on the nose too early. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things, as you recall, you maintain everything you can 
the same flight profile until you're fully impacted on the ground so that everything stays in the proper position. Yep. The hook to eye length, so this is one number I do remember, the, the distance between an altitude between the eye and this tail hook was 19.2 feet. So if you tried to eyeball it and cheat and spot the deck, you're probably going to get an early wire, yep. maybe even a hook slap, which yep. would be a bad day. Bad day. So we, we were very disciplined all the way to landing. But then there was that last moment where just a little bit of tweak helped do my boarding rate a lot of good. Wow. Well, let's move to the front of the airplane. Okay. Rhino, this was absolutely awesome. Thanks for taking me on the journey. Show the F-14 today, get to spend some time with you. Man, I can't tell you, this was, this was incredible and awesome. So thank you very much for that. It was more than my honor. You can tell I like talking about my jet of <laughs> yeah. All right, man, I'll see you around the ranch. Yeah. Thank you, sir, thank appreciate you it. Thank you for coming out.